true wisdom extends beyond accumulating knowledge. While learning and acquiring new information are important, it is equally vital to cultivate the ability to let go of outdated beliefs, perspectives and habits. Wisdom emerges from the deliberate process of shredding what no longer serves us, creating space for personal growth and transformation. And that comes from chapter two of your book, John. What what do you mean by shedding what no longer serves us and in order to grow? Yeah, well, Andrew, th- thank you for having me on your great show. It's such an honor to be able to be here and serve your audience. And as far as what I was talking about there is wisdom is one of the stoic virtues. And to me, your wisdom is really aligned with your passion and your purpose. And it kind of drives that. But when it gets to what no longer serves us, something that I talk about in the book is a quote by Henry David Thoreau, where he says that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And I think so many people today are finding themselves in this state of quiet desperation because we're put there by things that really don't serve us. Oftentimes we find ourselves in this place that we never expected ourselves to be. I certainly found that to be the case with myself. And I ended up in this, what I call portfolio of career that I never envisioned for myself when I was younger, but there I was nonetheless. And I struggled to break free. I was stuck because of all the burdens of life that were hitting me and the self doubt that was engulfing me. So one of the biggest burdens that I had to blow through was my own self-doubt and the fear that I could change the direction that I could get out of feeling stuck like I was at that time. And so that's what I'm really talking about in the passage that you reference is getting out of this ought state we find ourselves in and breaking through so that we can become our ideal self. And and I was thinking this morning, you know, what do I want our listeners to get from this episode today talking to you what do I want them to take away from it and what was the goal and I kind of came up with is to help guide them to live a more satisfied fulfilled life where they can take pride in in the things that they do because in, in my opinion if no matter whether you're mopping the floors or you're the CEO it's about taking that pride in everything you do and doing it with purpose you know, so you talk about living an intentional life. What does it actually mean to live an intentional life? Yeah, I think it's good to give some backdrop here. I am a huge fan of Angela Duckworth's work, in case any of the listeners are as well. And she had her groundbreaking book, Grit, where she really explores the power of passion and perseverance and how it can help lead us to a more fulfilling life. And she happens to start the book out by when she wrote it, examining cadets who were at West Point and what allowed some cadets to get through beast beast barracks and others not to. They further expanded this in 2019 to examine 11,000 cadets about what gets them through their entire experience at West Point. And they really came down to three things, physical ability, passion, and perseverance. I have a unique perspective on this because I went to a comparable university Uh, being the U.S. Naval Academy. And while I saw that physical attributes absolutely were necessary in helping you get through some of the trials, especially the physical ones that they throw throw at you, I still think that if you have the right mindset, you can still, even if you don't have those physical abilities, strive to get through them. It'll be a little bit tougher. You absolutely needed passion to drive you getting up in the day and the perseverance to get through the hurdles of going to a service academy. But one thing that I think she missed is something that she actually studies, which is self-control. And to me, intentionality has a lot to do with self-control. It's realizing if you're not on the correct path that you need to alter your actions and the choices that you're making and being intentional about taking the steps that will align your actions to your ambitions and your long-term aspirations. And that's really what I mean 
when I say being intentional. And a great example of this is when I was at the Naval Academy, I happened to be on the Brigade Honor Staff and we had the worst cheating scandal in the institution's history. And what that really showed me is here you had a whole bunch of midshipmen who obviously had made it to their junior year. They had a lot of passion and perseverance, but it, their intentionality shown a light here. They made the intentional choice to take gouge, to cheat on the exam, which in retrospect to many of them, they probably never thought it could have jeopardized their whole dream of being Naval or Marine Corps officers, but that's exactly what they did by not being intentional when they thought about cheating instead of doing the hard work to pass the exam on their own merits. And why did they do that? Why did were they not intentional about it? Has that been ingrained into them from childhood? Is that negative self-talk taken over? I think a lot of it comes down probably to peer pressure. When this happened, um, it was for the electrical engineering exam, and it's one of the most difficult courses that any of us had to take at the Naval Academy. I ended up doing it during summer school so I could focus solely on it without having to worry about the other engineering classes that we had to take in parallel to it. But I think that oftentimes we were given something called the gouge, but it wasn't typically exactly what was on the exam. It would be maybe close to it. It would give you an idea of what they were going to have. But in their case, it was exactly the same thing. And so what really struck a chord with me was that more of them didn't come forward when they discovered that it was the exact test. And, and we're talking hundreds of people who were implicated in this, probably half the class. So that to me was the bigger str strike or telling tale is when you knowingly did something and didn't come forward to, to really honor up to the fact that, uh, you had been given something that you didn't realize was actually the real thing and then didn't uh, raise your hand to, to forth come and tell the administration that something was wrong. Other midshipmen did, and that's kind of what unlocked this whole thing uh, into becoming the controversy that it was. But I think it was a lot of peer pressure, likely, and, and the fact that uh, – this is a hard exam and they were trying to use anything they could to one up uh, doing well on it. Absolutely. And it sounds like that's exactly what it's been. You, you actually say in your book and I've wrote it, while nonconformists may not always be right, the payoff is nothing short of massive when they are. And that reminded me of, it was Alex or Mose said something along the lines of pessimists are often right. Optimists are often rich. And I thought that was really interesting how, you know, the nonconformist, they, they may not be right 100% of the time, but, but you know, that small amount of the time where they are right, such a big payoff. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's definitely something to nonconformist, and it's something that I talk about in the book. I think so many of us today go down the path of becoming what I call imitators. We imitate whatever that tribe is that we become part of. And that ide ideology that is brought forward by the group, whether that's a political group you're part of, a religious group you're part of, a peer group you're part of, a work group you're part of, it infiltrates your life and your identity starts getting more and more tied to the identities of the group norms. And so it's difficult to break through that, but to live your authentic life, to live the life that you were uniquely put here to pursue, you've got to break through. You can't be an imitator. You've, you've got to be willing to stand up for what you think is right, even when it means that that could cause you personal repercussions because it goes against what the group feels. Yeah, it's getting away from that herd mentality, which so many people struggle to probably break free from and to stand alone, even when it's against everyone else in the room, to, to stand up and, and, and have a different opinion, essentially. And I wanted to go back to, obviously you mentioned the, the, 
quiet desperation. And I, I read that you you know it was worded the sort of masses of men live in quiet desperation because a lot of people that listen to podcasts and to this this podcast will resonate with that because. They, but they don't know how to get out of it. So they're stuck in this rut. They, they're they living this quiet desperation that you're talking about. They'll think, oh, that, that's me, but I've got nothing to offer the world. How do I break out of it? What would you say to people like that that feel like they, they're they maybe not exceptional at something in their own head? Or well, what do I have to offer? How do I break out of this, this mindset? Well, Andrew, I mean, this is one of the major reasons I wrote the book is I feel we have a lot of things that are hitting us around the world right now. People are feeling lonely. They're feeling hopeless. Mental health cases are on the rise. Mental health disorders are on the rise. Uh, and there's a lot of reason to feel pessimistic about what's going on right now. But when I started to do more and more research on what I think the underlying cause of all of this is, I think a lot of people wake up in the morning feeling like they don't matter. It's a state of unmattering or anti-mattering that you just alluded to. And it's an easy place to fall trapped to. I know even when most people would have seen me living what on the outside looked like a brilliant life, I was waking up every day feeling like I didn't matter because I had found myself in this endless trap where I was going into work every single day and it just became monotonous. It was an unending series of meetings, emails, presentations, what have you, HR issues that left me feeling drained instead of inspired. And when this keeps happening after a while, you start going down the proverbial toilet bowl of just thinking that none of it matters at all. And I found myself chasing after promotions, ticking off tasks, trying to amass material wealth. Yet in this pursuit, what I ended up encountering was a profound sense of emptiness and this sense that we're talking about of unmattering. And I don't think, as you're pointing to, I'm alone or your listeners are alone. In fact, Gallup points out that there are 900 million people in 142 countries who feel the same way. They feel unfulfilled by the life that they're leading. And I think this world that we're walking into with AI, automation, robotics is going to just make this even more profound. When you look at things such as studies that are coming out of Oxford University on your side of the pond or MIT on mine, that almost half of the jobs that we have today are going to be automated over the next 20 years. Or more profoundly, Google's top-rated future speaker, Thomas Frey, predicts that 2 billion jobs will be automated by 2030. So this quest for mattering, then, isn't just the superficial pursuit of monetary pleasure or efficiency hacks. It's a deeper rebellion, I think, against the societal norms that dictate our lives. It's a refusal to settle for a life that's defined by someone else's standards. And it's about breaking free from that and reclaiming our own power to author our own stories. And to me, it, it starts and ends with starting to have an intentional mindset around crafting the life that you want to create for yourself and really doubling down on trying to understand what makes you unique. Because I firmly believe each of us was born with in an eight uniqueness that we're supposed to explore and then utilize in a way that serves others. And I think that's one of the most paramount breaks we have to make is getting from this, I guess, world where so much of us are dictated by self and really seeing that it's about others and how we use our immense powers to do something in which we solve a problem that only we can solve for the benefit of others. And you mentioned automation there. And I want to, after, after this, I want to touch on AI and, and where you think it lies. 
but also you mentioned about the corporate job and you're amassing the material things, but there's just something missing. And so many people will resonate with that where they've said, I want to earn a hundred grand and I'll be happy. And they get there and then they go, oh, I'm not happy. So I need to adjust for inflation. So maybe it's 200 grand until I'm happy. And then they get there and the happiness never comes because there's something missing. And that's what I think, and I think uh, it, was, it was David Goggins was talking about in a, a podcast recently and, and he was talking about how, you know, he speaks to these ultra successful, ultra wealthy people who've got it all on the surface, but they say there's just something missing. And, and it's not financial, it's not career success, they just can't put their finger on it. And, and that's where the passion and the, the intentionality comes into it. Like you talk about filling that gap, filling that void and giving yourself the fulfilment and the satisfaction, I suppose. Yeah, so I, I love the work of David Goggins and he has a very inspirational message and it's really how do you pursue through hardship and use the Navy SEAL mentality that he developed uh, to do that. And I think a lot of what he says rings true. And I think there are a number of those people who you've mentioned, these billionaires that we see who reach this point where they have everything that you could possibly imagine and they just want more and more and more. And it's interesting because as I have examined thousands of leaders and as I have read the work of others who have done the same thing, the one key differentiation that makes those who pursue living and chasing after their dreams from others is that they pursue constant reinvention, meaning once they reach a certain plateau of success, they don't allow themselves to be stagnant there. They go to the next thing, which is different from saying that you want to have a hundred thousand dollar job and then you need a $200,000 job and then a 300,000. This is a bit more about uh, pursuing your life's passion. And once you've created a movement or reached a certain pillar, you're looking at this as that's not a stopping point. I have the opportunity to enhance or to enrich more people's lives, which is a completely different way to think about it than thinking about it from the monetary success that you can achieve. And it's, I was certainly going down the latter approach for much of my life where I, I, I mean, I was right there. I was at a consulting firm. I loved the job. But an opportunity came where I could make 30% more, so I jumped on the opportunity. Uh, before long, I was hitting that milestone, and I wanted to, to double what I was making then, so I looked for more opportunities, and it just started this never-ending and unreachable, unreachable, I guess, ladder that I was trying to climb that led to nowhere. And I think it's interesting if you really – look into the work of those who have studied blue zones or at the Harvard study of adult aging, which has been going on now for over 80 years. And if people aren't familiar with it, what they did in the study is they examined two groups of men. Um, one group came out of Harvard, John F. Kennedy, our former president was part of the, the group that was analyzed. And this other group came from the other side of the tracks who weren't privileged like these Harvard men were. And what it showed is it didn't matter how much money you made. It didn't matter if you were completely desolate or if you were a billionaire or the president. What it really came down to was, were you pursuing your passions? Were you living up to your potential? And most importantly, it came down to the connections and the relationships that these men built. And surprisingly, those same three things, including an additional aspect, which is focusing on physical and mental health, are the same things that are found in the blue zones throughout the world uh, for people who have lived uh, well into 100 years plus in their life. 
So I think we can learn a lot from that, that it's really about the relationships, finding purpose and passion and dedicating our lives to something more than self that really bring true fulfillment and contentment. Have you came across the minimalists? The, the two yes. guys? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, there might be three of them. Um, Is there three? I think there's three. Yeah, they were supposed to be on my podcast. And, uh, oh, really? And, and, it, and it ended up not happening, and I was going to be on theirs. That didn't happen either. But, yes, I'm fans of the work that they do. Uh, and it's excellent. You know, I haven't read any other books in a few years now, but what you were saying, going back to what you were saying about amassing things and the material things that you, you build up, you know, the, the first time I read their first book, like 10 years ago or whatever it was, it was an eye opener because it was, you know, they talk about, you know, you get the corporate job, you get the, the money and stuff and you've got the car or two cars in the driveway and you've got all the stuff in your house. I think the average household has like, it's, it's six figures, like 200,000 items in the household, you know, and, and they, they spoke about, sorry to go off on a tangent here, but it was, you know, you, you were talking there and I was thinking, you know, that, that's, that's what the underlying root of all of this is connected. And they, they talked about packing their whole house into the spare bedroom or the, the spare sitting room as if they were moving house and they put everything into boxes, every single possession they own, the cutlery, you name it. And they decided that over the next, I think it was 30 days, I might be misquoting here because it's a while for I read, I think it was 30 days, we'll only unpack something as we need it. So, you know, they get to the end of the 30 days and a huge amount, something like 80% of the, the stuff is still packed in the boxes. And it shows that we have all this stuff that we just don't need and we think it's filling a gap. And that kind of ties back to when you're talking about intentionality and having a purpose in life. We're, we're trying to fill it with all this material stuff, but actually it's not it's not material it's the reason that people do cold water therapy and they go into an ice bath and they, you know, I love going into sauna, into ice water and back and forward and, you know, pushing yourself that bit further in the gym because you've got a purpose and you're you're achieving something, which is getting those endorphins and various different chemicals in your brain firing. Yeah, so one of my favorite authors, and you're right, the minimalist books are, are really good for that exact thing. Another author who has written something similar is Gretchen Rubin, who is really one of the foremost experts on happiness, but she also wrote a book called Outer Order, Inner Calm. And she really talks about her exploration of getting rid of all the non-necessities in her life. And one of her favorite things to do is to go to friend's house and help them clean out their closets. And I tried this experiment that you're talking about myself. And I started to put stickers on pieces of clothing in my closet. And then I would take the sticker off if I wore that piece of apparel over a 30 day basis. And I'd say 90% of my closet, including my shoes were never worn. And so after that, uh, I started to purge things that I wasn't wearing. Uh, obviously, some things like suits, etc., I, I kept because depending on what stage you are in life, you might be wearing them more than others. But I think both of those are really great examples that we spend so much of our life accumulating, 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 and all it really does is bring us burdens that we need to accumulate more. And then we ended up getting in this cycle that instead of driving a Toyota, we have to drive a BMW. Instead of having a, a nice flat, we have to have some a, a townhome that is 10 times better. And does it bring you any more happiness? No. I used to be this person that wanted to change my car every two years 
And I've now had the same Toyota 4Runner since 2008. It's got 180,000 miles on it. And does it make a difference if I drive that? Or if I had a brand new Mercedes-Benz? I think not. I mean, one might give me a little bit more comfort, but they both still take you to the same place. And I think it's those little choices that we make I'm not saying that someone shouldn't reward themselves if they've always wanted a Highline car and that's always been their dream, but I don't think it's going to bring you any more happiness than driving a Renault or something else is going to. Absolutely. And the, the, the purchase, the pursuit of the purchase is more satisfying than owning the thing. And that, that, that has been proven that, you know, you, you're going to buy a new car and it's your dream car. It's got all the things you want. You order it and there's a month to wait. That that month waiting on it has got more excitement than you will have when you get the car. Maybe for the first few days, you know, you're driving around and you, you look cool and stuff like that. But owning the thing is is not as good as the the hype running up to it and and that's exactly what you're talking about it's it, it's definitely a mental thing and, and these things don't bring happiness probably the sooner you realize that the better because you're not going to waste time pursuing these things was there a trigger for you because you had the corporate job and you talked about amassing these things was there a moment where you decided this isn't fulfilling me? This isn't making me happy. I don't feel satisfied. Was there, was there something that happened? Was there a trigger that made you say, I want to make a change? So I think each of us has a couple of voices in our head and I'm not talking the schizophrenic voices. I'm just talking the voices that talk to us, that inner voice that kind of guides what we do. And the main one that drives us is the one that keeps telling us to do the same thing every single day because it feels effortless to do so. And then we have another inner voice that's farther back in our mind that I think a few of us rarely ever hear. And the reason we don't hear it is because it gets blocked out by all the noise and activity and distractions that we have in our life. And if you really find a way to discover that deeper inner voice, I think it leads you on this journey that you were born to take. And that's exactly what was happening to me. I got so consumed into life, my job and the hours I was working and then spending time with my wife and kids. And if I could with friends or, or watching TV or whatever it, may have, but I wasn't setting setting aside dedicated self-care time to really spend quality time with myself, really probing my inner thoughts and going back to your discussion on mattering. I think this is the trap that so many of us fall into. And so we then have these periods like getting up in the morning or before we go to sleep or that we feel rotten, like we haven't accomplished anything in our day. And so a huge change for me was starting to dedicate time in my schedule where I had dedicated time for that self-care. And I know it sounds difficult to do. And for me, I was not a morning person, but when I looked at my life and the kids and everything else, the morning time was really the only time that I could build it into my schedule. I started a practice of getting up, uh, in the wee early hours of the morning. And I found it transformational because it awakened this inner voice inside me that started guiding me on the true path that I was taking. Now, oftentimes this inner voice comes to you and it gives you a message that maybe you don't want to hear or is difficult to understand. For me, it told me that I was supposed to be helping the beaten, battered, bored, broken, lonely, and helpless of the world. And I'll tell you, when you're sitting in the C-suite of a Fortune 50 company and that message comes to you, you don't know what the heck to do with it. And that's exactly what happened to me is I kept ignoring it. And 
the more I ignored it, the more misfortunes started happening in my life. And I think the voice started to become louder and more apparent in different ways. For me, it, it almost became apparent in biblical like fashions where I had experiences with scorpions dropping out of the ceiling and floods in my flat and bed bugs and termite damage and uh, other personal misfortunes that I think looking back was the universe telling me that I'm not living the life that was destined for me to take. And ultimately I kept, I kept ignoring it. And what this amounted to was me having more point that in 2017, I ended up going to the gym, which I did and still do pretty much every day. I dropped my daughter off at school. This day was unlike any other because we happened to have a uh, electrical fire at the gym. Fire trucks came, etc., and I was forced to go home early. And then what ended up happening, I could have never predicted in a million years. It turns out that there had been a gentleman who had been examining my whereabouts, had seen that I was usually gone for this period of time, and decided to use it as an entry point to come in and rob me. And unfortunately for me, I walked in on him in the middle of it. And so I didn't know it at the time, but I walked up my staircase. And as I was uh, running up the staircase, I, I think your spidey sense starts kicking in that something isn't right. And about that same time, I heard deep, uh, excited breathing. And I realized I wasn't home alone. And as I made the, the turn to go up the rest of the stairs because of my momentum, I think my military training came into play and I started then looking for a threat. And as I rounded the corner, I saw a man standing there pointing a gun at me. It turned out to be my own handgun. And I think when life throws you situations like this, it, it leaves you with very few choices. In this case, I had to make a split second decision, do I continue to run up the stairs and try to tackle the person and take him down? And it, it turns out he was a bigger person than me, or do I try to find a way to evade and live to, to try to figure this out and pursue another day? And luckily I was able to evade him and got out. And just as I was beginning to process this about five days later, um, Unfortunately, one of my best friends ended up uh, taking his own life. And so these two events within a week of each other over the ensuing weeks and months really, really hit me hard. And it brought me to this drastic realization that I, I had spent the better part of two decades making the dreams of others come true, but I wasn't really pursuing my own dreams and following this inner voice that was telling me that there was this other path that I should be taking. And it was that state that I made the decision that I was going to figure out how do I get myself from being in this place of feeling stuck to breaking free and creating what I now call a passion struck life um, and doing what I'm doing now, which is completely different uh, than what I was doing then. But it's really helping those group of people that my inner voice was telling me to help. Long, long winded answer, but hopefully that gives a little bit more context to my story. The, looking up your own stairs at someone pointing a gun at you in your own home, more so your own gun, must be a life-changing experience. I mean, it definitely was. At the time, I didn't realize it was my own gun. Uh, that's what it turned out to be when we later on discovered it was missing. But yes, never, nevertheless, I hadn't had that happen to me um, since I had been in combat 15 years before that. So definitely brought a whole bunch of prior emotions and experiences and trauma back to the forefront that I had worked through in the past. And now um, was, I found myself engulfed, not just in this situation, but in all the past trauma um, reawakening its dirty head. So yes. Yeah, that's uh... Enough to 
to give every, anyone a, a moment like that, a, a, an awakening moment. You talk about how you wanted to help others and you got this calling to help others who maybe were, like we were talking about earlier, living in quiet desperation. And that's something recently I've posted a lot on LinkedIn and social media about my own journey for the last year or so, sort of improving as a person, fitness, health, mindset, trying to have more fulfillment and some of the things you talk about, which is actually, which is why I reached out to you today because it, it resonates a lot. And for me, a lot of people started reaching out, you know, private messaging on LinkedIn when they seen a, a post and they were inspired. They were saying, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in a rut myself. H how do I take the next step? And they were asking questions and the feeling of coming back to them and saying, right, well, you know, here's what I've done, here's what worked for me, and giving them a sort of framework. I started replying to these people and, and giving them the framework that worked for me. And then I just started posting saying, if anyone's looking to make a change, if they're stuck in that rut, just reach out and I'll, I'll send you over some information that's worked for me. And then when people start coming back to you and saying, you know, I got up this morning at 6am, went to the gym because I seen your post last night about going to the gym and how, you know, I'll post and say, I really didn't want to go to the gym today. It was the last thing I wanted to do. It's raining outside. It's freezing cold. The work was really stressful. Every excuse under the sun. But put your trainers on, forced myself to go to the gym, felt amazing afterwards. And just posting about that and people reaching out and saying, because I seen that, you know, I went to the gym or done something that I wouldn't have ordinarily done to better myself. And the satisfaction from doing that is like nothing else compares, nothing else compares. So you must have found that on on a, an even bigger scale than I have because I just casually do it, you know, to, to help out anyone that, that, that I'm connected with. But you must get a lot of that satisfaction. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more satisfying to me than someone who's read the book or listened to a podcast episode or seen a piece of content that I've written or put on social media where it touches them and it gets them to start reflecting on maybe what's keeping them stuck or gives them hope that there's the possibility to change, to break free from this. So yeah, that aspect has been very rewarding. I mean, it's, it's to me, the reason I do it, I, I don't do this necessarily to make money. I I've been doing it to try to help people become better. I mean, if the money happens, then it's a nice ancillary benefit. Uh, but the main driver has been to fulfill that calling that I've been given. And the more I lean into doing that and to helping people, the more I do feel fulfilled, the, the more I do feel like I have a purpose and that purpose is to help others break free and to, hopefully create the best life for themselves that they possibly can. Absolutely. And, and in years gone past, I would look at what you're talking about. I would look at people who say they take satisfaction from helping others, that their calling is to help other people. And I'd be quite skeptical, which a lot of other people may be. I'd think, oh, you know, that you're, you're, you're trying to do it for money or whatever, you know, when I've seen these people and when you actually get a taste of it yourself and help each other, help other people and see them, benefit from it it just makes you realize it, it really is the most satisfying thing you can do and they say a rising tide lifts all ships and you know so when you start sh looking after yourself or, or or doing things to to better yourself and watching the people around you you know you start going to the gym five six times a week suddenly you see people around you are doing the same thing and 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 yeah just can't beat that feeling you know and I said we wanted to touch on AI, you know, because you mentioned automation there and I did want to ask you, I'm sure you get asked all the time, your thoughts on AI and how fast it's moving. It's not something that's moving slowly in any way because every time you look online or you read an article about it, you see the advancements are, are, are so fast and as has been predicted by a lot of experts that have spoke about it, what do you think about AI and going forward, how, how's it going to affect life? I think AI is like a lot of uh, technology and things that we've brought to the world, whether it's been 
preservatives that we put in our food or social media capabilities that uh, we've created or other tools, even if you look at uh, a Fitbit or an Apple um, watch that you wear, I think we end up creating all these things with absolutely great intentions. And oftentimes we don't think about what the bad actors can do with them. And I'll go back to that Fitbit or that Apple watch just as an example because a number of U.S. troops were using them in combat, unknowingly giving up their position to the enemy who was able to hack into that watch to determine their whereabouts. The same thing with, I think, when we created preservatives, when they were originally created, these were looked at as magic ingredients that would elongate the period of time that something could sit on a shelf, not thinking about the long-term implications that it's having now on mental health, physical health, the rise of cancer, the rise of dementia, and everything else that's been linked to all these chemicals that we put not only in our food, but in many of the cleaning products that we use and deodorants and everything else that are significantly now impacting our health and actually causing it to decline, um, even when we have all this amazing medicine that should be elongating our lives. Um, and so when it comes to AI, I think it's the same thing. Um, it's a great evolution of what technology could do. I think it's extremely important for anyone to be a constant learner and to explore and understand everything you can about AI, because I think if you don't double down on it, you're going to miss a whole paradigm shift that's happening that I don't think is going to stop. So I would encourage people to keep uh, using it. I, I use it all the time. Uh, it's made various aspects of my life much easier. I still don't think it can replicate the creativity and innovation that our human mind can. Uh, and But I would encourage people to double down on those things And those skill sets that won't change our ability to communicate with others, the need for adaptability, the desire to be a lifelong learner, uh, the importance of emotional intelligence. I mean, those things are never going to go out of style. The other thing I think I would caution people on is, as I've really studied and written about AI, the thing that scares me the most is if you just look at autonomous vehicles, some of the world's greatest scientists who are examining what ends up happening in the decisions that AI makes don't understand many of the decisions that it is making and choosing to take one action instead of another. Why it sometimes will purposely crash a car uh, because it predicts that that's a safer outcome than continuing to go. I think it's one of the reasons they haven't put it yet into more aircraft is because of they're afraid of the decisions that it might make. I have friends who fly for the major airlines, specifically in the Airbus, where the main difference between an Airbus and a Boeing, as I understand it, is that a Boeing reverts back to the pilot's control, whereas an Airbus reverts to the computer's control in times of emergency. And there have been so many cases where An Airbus will just take actions that the pilot cannot understand or comprehend why it's doing even aborting landings when everything seemed to be perfect. Uh, And so I think there's a lot of gotchas if you think about this and how it's going to expand. The biggest thing I think I would tell people is that, you know, this train is coming. You you know that what companies are going to look to do because they're driven by top line and bottom line is to replace repetitive jobs or things that aren't probably as efficient as they possibly can. If AI can outsource those positions, just like moving jobs to India, the Philippines or somewhere else, they're going to do the same thing with AI. I mean, any corporate CEO who's driven by their shareholders would make that decision every single time. So it's time now to really think about as you're exploring AI, what are the future trends that are out there? 
where AI is not going to be able to replace those jobs, or perhaps you're using AI to take the position and to magnify it by 10 times what it can do. That's where I think people need to be looking at, not at what's staring you right now, but what's going to be available five to 10 years from now, and really start learning about how you can leverage either utilizing AI in ways to enhance your job or to find skill sets that you can bring to bear that will be needed regardless of what AI is going to do. Absolutely. I think, unfortunately, it's going to be a case of get on board with it or or be left behind, which is, you know, a lot of split opinion about that. When you spoke about conformity and the herd mentality, I had wrote down actually, and I've got it here, I wrote down a, another little line from your book, which today's digital world is more competitive than ever, yet large and small businesses alike find it easier to stick with familiar ideas, procedures and ways of doing business. Inertia kicks in following unwritten rules or guidelines in an industry or sector because that's the way things have always been done. Seems like the path of least resistance. And I read that and it, you know, you said businesses that say, well, that's the way things have always been done. And that is my number one bugbear. I say it to people in our business all the time. Just the worst answer in the world is that's because eh, that's the way we've always done it. And I've got a story I tell. It's an old story I heard it ages ago, years ago. And it's that my, you know, my wife makes a an excellent Sunday roast which is probably not as big a thing in the States, is it? Um, she makes an excellent Sunday roast and she always cuts the ends off the ham before she puts it in the pan. So I said to her one day, why do you always cut the ends off the ham? She said, eh, because my mum always done it that way. And that's that's how I picked it up from my mum. Okay. So I says, well, your mum's coming for dinner tonight. So we'll ask her when she gets here, why did she always cut the ends off the ham? So the mother arrives and we say, you know, why did you always cut the ends off the ham? And of course she says, eh, because my mum always done it that way. So we phoned her grandmother <laughs> and said, why did you always cut the ends off the ham? We were making a Sunday roast. She said, because my pan wasn't big enough. So it just shows that just because something has always been done that way, it's it's not always the best way to do it. But But so many people fall into that trap of just what you're talking about here, you know, the path of least resistance, it's easy just to not change things up. It's easy just to keep doing it that way. Have you found that it's a challenge to get people to break out of that mindset? So I think it's human nature. And if you want to see how cyclical this is, just go back to the Fortune 500 list. Pretty much any period of time 20 years ago. So if you look at the Fortune 50 list from 20 years ago to today, I pretty much guarantee you that 70 to 75% of the companies that were on it then are no longer on that list. And the vast, some might have gotten acquired, but the vast majority don't keep up with changing times. And I think with the evolution of technology, this burden of having to constantly reinvent, either it's a company or yourself, is becoming more and more paramount. I mean, just look at the example of coffee. I remember as a kid growing up, it was Folgers and a couple other brands, and that was it. That's what you dreamed of when you got a cup of coffee. And then in the 19, late 80s, early 90s, Starbucks comes on the scene, and all, the, all of a sudden, we went from drinking terrible coffee at the house to spending three, four dollars for a cup of coffee out at a store. Who would have thought that paradigm shift would have happened? But so many things have shifted like that. And this barrier to entry becomes less and less because of what technology and now AI can do. So the analogy of this is really that we should live our lives through life's windshield and not the rearview mirror. And the way I like people to think about this is every day we encounter somewhere between 60,000 and 90,000 thoughts. And when we don't know how to quiet that inner voice that I mentioned earlier, the one that keeps telling us to repeat the patterns over and over again, 
because we subconsciously fear change. I mean, it's the same thing that happens in companies. When I was the CIO, people would often ask me, what's the hardest part of implementing any new technology solution? And I said, about 15% of it is the technology itself. About 35% of it is putting the new processes in place. And about 50% of it comes down to winning over the hearts and minds of the employees and getting them to change the way that they've always operated. The same thing applies with the metaphor of looking through life's windshield rather than through the rearview mirror, because doing so symbolizes forward focused living. It's it being intentional about the actions that you're taking and ensuring that they align with your aspirations and your ambitions. It teaches us to gaze forward towards those goals and aspirations rather than dwelling on past mistakes and missed opportunities. And I think in life, we often ponder the fact, are we on the path of becoming our ideal selves? And this really gets into self discrepancy theory, uh, which is really about, we have our actual self, which is who we are. And so many of us end up pursuing our ought self, O-U-G-H-T, because it's who we think we should become, because that's what the burdens in life present to us. That's what society tells us. But looking through the forward window is really pursuing that third version of ourself, which is our ideal self, the person that we aspire to be. And when we look in the rearview mirror, we tend to linger in our minds. In contrast, what ends up happening is we start focusing on the regrets, the potholes in the roll, ro road, all those things that linger, the mistakes, instead of looking at them as purely stumbling blocks and how they represent merely a speed bump on the road to what lies ahead in the journey that we can take. And so this mindset shift, this perspective shift is extremely important for those who are looking to get unstuck in their life. Absolutely. And that leads on to the sort of final, you know, before we finish up, what would you say to someone who's, like we've spoke about, they're, they're stuck in that rut, they're, they're stuck and they just want to have more intentionality, they want to have more purpose in their life, more fulfillment and satisfaction. What's the number one thing they can do to, to break out of that? So at the time of this recording, I've, I've already written this solo episode that I'm doing in a couple of weeks. And it's really around this whole concept that people think that they need to have confidence or some level of knowing what's ahead or passion before they take action. And they have the equation completely inversed. Action is what helps you to uncover your passion. Action is what helps you to build confidence and then gives you that inner feeling that you can do more, which allows you to take more boundary expanding actions that magnify where you are in life. And I think what people end up doing is they try to take too grandiose a step towards this person they want to become. And then they don't accomplish it, and it leads to a lot of self-doubt that comes about on it. And so what I encourage people to do is something that my career coach helped me with is picture yourself on a stool in your kitchen or a chair. And underneath it, for those of us who found ourselves stuck, what typically is sitting underneath it is one major support that is much larger than the other supports that are sitting underneath that chair. For me, it was the constant pursuit of the grind. For another person, it could be something completely different. But now I want you to think about your life and that chair having a whole bunch of different pillars underneath it that are in alignment. They can be anything that you choose them to be. For me, I ended up picking physical health, mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, relationship health, et cetera, to be my pillars. But then what you end up having to do is you've got to pick one of those pillars that is probably causing you the most disalignment. For me, at the point of time that I started to pull myself out of this 
quiet desperation. It was my mental health. And so I started by purely learning again how to be mindful. And for me, that was the boundary expanding action that started it all. And was I fearful about having to learn mindfulness again? Yes. Did I think it was a bunch of rubbish when I started this out? Yes. Was I doubtful it would ever even work? Yes. But I kept taking steps to do it. I bought a book. I started studying the book. I started implementing the changes. And even when I started implementing them, I thought this is the most stupid thing I'm doing. I can barely sit here for 30 seconds without my mind wandering. And guess what? Recognizing that your mind wandering, that your mind is wandering is the first step to becoming more mindful and pulling yourself back to the present moment. And so what I didn't do was to try to do a whole bunch of other activities to better other parts of my life in conjunction with this. But what I found out is as I continued on this path to mindfulness, it ended up naturally leading to other areas of my life improving because I took action. I found more confidence. I took more action, found more confidence. It ultimately led for me finding passions that I didn't even know I had, and then to start pursuing different changes in other areas of my life that built up over time to what I call creating a tsunami of greatness in your life. So that would be my advice to listeners is to start small boundary expanding actions that create more courage in you to take more, which is that, which is another stoic virtue, which then leads to confidence, which then leads to more action and action leads to action is the most important thing that I could share uh, to conclude today. It sure does. Thanks very much. Your new book it just came out. I'm about, 30 or 40% of the way through it. And it's really, really good. Really enjoying it. Where can people get it? <clears throat> um, so right now in Scotland, uh, the, the, really the only place that you can get it is on Amazon or um, possibly your o- other local bookstore sites that you have. But here in the States, Amazon, Walmart, Target, Barnes and Noble. But I, as people have been asking me, Amazon does ship it. It'll take about uh, a week and a half to arrive, but uh, it is possible to order it. Yeah, I've I've actually got it on my Kindle. I read it on my uh, or or that's that's the easiest way is to, to yeah. order it electronically. And the audio book, I'm scheduled to record it, so that will be coming out shortly as well. If you prefer an audio version uh, of it as well. Thanks very much. And where can people connect with you? So I thank you for, for allowing me to answer this. Um, the best two places would be either uh, johnrmiles.com, R is my middle, and I have to use it because there's a famous English rock star who's my distant cousin named John Miles, and I cannot beat him on social <laughs> exposure, so I had to use the middle initial. Uh, or the other place would be passionstruck.com, and there you can find the book, the podcast, our courses, our eBooks, everything. I would like to mention that um, for the people who are pre-ordering the book, I had some of the bonuses out. Um, Initially, it was around the launch, but now if you buy the book and you give your order number and you go to passionstruck.com, passionstruck book, and put it in, I'll send you some amazing things that further expand the book. One is an ebook on the deliberate action process that I talk about in the back half of the book. Another one is a mini book on how to create success in your life. One will help you overcome self-doubt and the other really goes into how do you create a sense of mattering. There's another ebook on intrinsic motivation. There's a reader's guide that if you want to use this as a, as a book group in a classroom, et cetera, that I will also provide. And then lastly, there's a short mini course that I do on five different ways to find your purpose in life. So all of that uh, will be sent to you. Thanks very much, John. And I think people listening have had an amazing amount of value from this discussion today. So really, thanks very much for that. 
Well, thank you for having me. And I feel like we just hit the tip of the iceberg on what's in the book uh, because it really goes deep in giving you 12 steps that will help you to take back your life and help you to go from being stuck to becoming passion struck. Thank you, John. And if I could ask one favor of anyone listening, could you take five seconds and just hit subscribe, follow on whatever platform you're listening on? It has a massive impact and it allows me to bring you more great people like John. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for being here. It was such an honor.